Good afternoon, everybody, and you're all very welcome to this Intertrade Ireland All Island Innovation Programme event. My name is Dr. Majala Giblin, and I'm faculty at the School of Business and Economics at NUI Galway. And I'm delighted to be chairing this event this afternoon, which is hosted by the Whitaker Institute at NUI Galway. So this event is part of the All Island Innovation Programme, uh, supported by Intertrade Ireland. And in this programme, we deliver and disseminate academic thought leadership um, around innovation and supporting SMEs in engaging in innovation and, and growing. So uh, the topic of today's uh, event um, is particularly topical and significant as we're focusing on sustainability in organizations. So in general, there is agreement that it's important to strategically embed uh, the sustainable development goals in uh, SMEs. But how we actually go about doing this is a challenging question. So I'm delighted and honored to uh, present you and to welcome Professor Jay Friedlander, who is going to discuss that uh, this afternoon. Uh, Professor Friedlander is faculty member in sustainable business at College of the Atlantic Bar Harbor, Maine. And he's joining us live from Maine this afternoon, which is morning time for him, of course. <laughs> um, he is founding uh, Sharp McNally Chair of Green and Socially Responsible Business. And his research transcends sustainability, social innovation and entrepreneurship. He has created the Abundance Cycle, which I'm sure he'll talk to you about today, which aims to maximize um, the three pillars of sustainability, environment, economic and social. His work has been published in MIT Slow Management Review, Stanford Social Innovation Review, and the New York Times. Um, he's also Babson College Senior Fellow in Social Innovation and, and speaks globally in the area of sustainable innovation. Prior to joining the College of the Atlantic, Jay was the Chief Operating Officer as well for O Naturals Inc., which is a natural and organic fast food restaurant group. So um, we'll structure the event as follows um, for this lecture. We'll, um, Jay will present for approximately 30 minutes or so. And then um, please use the Q&A function that you see at the bottom of your screen uh, for, for asking any questions or indeed posting any comments that you have for Jay. And then at the end of these presentations, we'll go through those questions and comments and Jay will address them. So, um, Without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Jay and I very much uh, look forward to your presentation, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us from Maine. Thank you, Majella, and thank you for having me and hello to everyone. It's, it's an honor to be here. And uh, this is a topic I'm incredibly excited about and I've really spent my whole career working on. I'm gonna share my screen with you and uh, put up the presentation. So just let me know if that, let's see here. Are we all good? Can yes, you see? Okay. we can see Terrific. it. So, so the sustainable development goals, as uh, Magella was saying, was they're really, um, you know, we just had the COP arrangements. We'll see what comes out of there. I mean, to me, the most exciting piece about the sustainable development goals is this unleashing of innovation. Um, and before we go there, just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, so I am, uh, I live in the United States right here on this small island. So I felt very comfortable being part of the all island innovation program. Indeed, I think there's a ton of innovations happening on island communities everywhere. Um, so this is a, a quick look at what my island looks like. I actually live in the town that's just down here in Bar Harbor, Maine. And I teach at uh, College of the Atlantic which has a real history of creating solutions and we're an Oceanside campus uh, in Maine. And that has been cited for the last six years as the most sustainable school uh, in the United States by the Princeton Review. Um, my program in the college has been recognized by in a number of areas, everyone from the National Science Foundation uh, to NASA. We've been in the press, as Magella mentioned, for higher education also in innovation with a, a range of things from Fast Company, uh, Triple Pundit, et cetera, in the business and media press, as well as in the, in the general press from the New York Times, the AP, et cetera. So it is a, it's a small school on the coast of Maine, but is seen as a real innovator, uh, particularly in the area of sustainability. 
Now, as Magella mentioned, um, I come at this as both an entrepreneur and a professor. And in fact, when I was an entrepreneur working in the natural organic foods industry, um, the, the models you'll see and the perspectives I'll be talking about really came out of that. And I developed the abundance cycle like many good entrepreneurial endeavors because there was nothing there at the time when we were, um, when I was uh, working in the natural organic foods industry. And also I was a professor at Babson College at the time. And I was looking for good models uh, on how to incorporate sustainability seamlessly into the enterprise. And, and I couldn't find any. So like many entrepreneurs, I went out and created one. Now I've given uh, this presentation or, or derivatives of it in about 17 different countries all over the world, everywhere from Greenland to Australia and Japan and Mexico. I just spent this last summer in Colombia and small and medium sized enterprises to me are really you know, the backbone of the economy. Um, and many of them are facing the same problems that larger corporations are facing as well. And that Magella brought up, which is, okay, I love the sustainable development goals. I'm all for them. And this question of like, okay, but what do I do with them? How do I actually incorporate them into my enterprise? And so uh, this morning or this afternoon rather for you, um, we'll be looking at how you can unleash innovation uh, with the sustainable development goals. And we'll really be following There'll be three sort of phases or vignettes that we'll go through. And this will all happen rather quickly. And then we'll go into the master class uh, afterwards to, to dive a little bit deeper. But the first is really changing perspective and moving from this idea of scarcity and risk and compliance to opportunity and innovation. I'll give you a, I'll show you a way where you can benchmark best practices fairly easy and see how you're doing uh, versus, the, uh, com versus your competitors. And so then you can see who do I need to look at uh, to get some of these best practices. And then finally, we'll move into the strategic innovation and we'll look at how you can merge your strategy and sustainability uh, with the abundance cycle. And in each one of these phases, it's about improving your performance along sustainability and your enterprise. And now as we go through this, I think what should be running in the back of your mind is how can I apply this to my enterprise? What are the lessons that I can take from this? Which are the pieces I can use? And from what I've seen, if you don't start with changing your perspective on how you see the sustainable development goals, the other pieces don't matter as much. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time there and then move through these things. As I said, this will be rather uh, quick. I do you know, much longer seminars, but this is just kind of a taste. Um, and you can definitely check out the Abundance Cycle website, AbundanceCycle.com for uh, more information. So to start with changing perspective, you know, I don't know about you, and you know, I know you're at midday over in Ireland, you know, I'm just starting my morning here, but I think you can remember way back to this morning when you woke up. I don't know, I wonder how many of you leapt out of bed this morning and said, oh, I really want to sustain. That's my goal for today is I really want to sustain myself. And you know that, which is obviously the root of the word sustainability. And the thing is, people don't want to, inherently don't want to sustain. They want to thrive. They want to grow their businesses. They want society to be richer. Um, and so the very word sustainability is sometimes fraught. And, it's, and a lot of it has been framed up as a series of trade-offs. And so we're looking to shift that perspective around. Um, if you look at the traditional, the three Ps, people, planet, and profit, oftentimes um, people look at sustainability and this idea of risk and scarcity. And they think sustainability means you need to suffer appropriately and take a shorter shower. And instead, what if we looked at it a different way and said, well, wait, this could be about living life better, finding new solutions, satisfying business goals, um, and move from this idea of it being a regulatory uh, regime to something that sparks compliance. Or right now, the, the, in the US, the sustainability community um, is oftentimes at loggerheads with the business community. And, they, and it's seen as a zero sum game. Whereas if people and the planet benefit, that profits have to suffer. And so we wanna look at um, actually how you could change that around. The other thing that gets in people's way is the sustainable development goals, there are 17 of them. 
Now, I don't know how many of you can do 17 things uh, or think about 17 things at once. I, I can, it's nearly impossible. So we've sort of uh, created these meta categories to think about uh, what is happening in people and the planet. And so for the people, fundamentally, you're looking at improving the workplace, building community and solving social issues. On the planetary side, it's really about reducing your waste, becoming regenerative, um, or looking at waste as a resource. Now, instead of looking at these things as something that must inherently impede business, what if we looked at these things as ways that we can achieve the goals that business wants to achieve, um, such as reducing risks, cutting costs, and growing sales? And so in the best of, in the best of worlds, when you're looking at people in the planet, this becomes a, a new filter with which you can look at your business and really unveiling a new perspective of how do I think about people in the planet in ways that will help my enterprise. Now, if you step back for a moment from the sustainability question, you know, having a new perspective is a key aspect of all entrepreneurs, right? They see problems uh, or they see solutions where other people only solve problems or never even noticed that something was wrong. And so by asking a new set of questions, you find new solutions to problems. So, you know, on the one hand, you could look at um, sustainable development goals as government demands or a regulatory regime that people are trying to impose. Um, but what I do is I think about them as new sources of value. And so like the abundance cycle, all of, all of these things are the abundant perspective. Each one of these, you know, will cause you to ask a new set of questions and look for new solutions. And so briefly, I'd like you to consider uh, the cardboard box, right? And now what, what could you create with a different perspective if you looked at a, a cardboard box? And um, you know, this is something that is fairly ubiquitous around the world. Um, you know, it, it's used uh, you know, for shipping objects. Oftentimes the most popular uh, present at the holidays is not the gifts themselves, but the actual cardboard box. But let's just take a, a UN sustainable development goal here, like uh, responsible consumption and pr production and consider what could we do with this box? Now, there's a company in China called Nine Dragons Paper. And the woman who founded this saw this cardboard box and instead of seeing it as a piece of garbage, she saw it as an opportunity. And so what she started doing uh, when she began her company, you know, a small enterprise, um, she was taking waste from dumps in China and recycling them and recycling the cardboard. Um, and eventually, you know, this small business grew and she went to the most wasteful place on the planet, right, the United States. And then she started buying all of our cardboard boxes that we were throwing out because we just saw them as waste, something without value. And she shipped them back to China in empty container ships, remanufactured them, and then brought them back to the US and sold them. And then what did we do? We threw them out, et cetera. And the cycle continued. Here is the woman. Uh, her name is Zhang Yin. And today her net worth is about four to $5 billion. And she's one of the richest women in the world. And again, this just started out as a small enterprise um, taking waste that, you know, taking an, something people were throwing out, saw as waste and use that waste to create a new product or as nutrition or food to, to build something new. Um, when China started cracking down on foreign waste being imported, um, a part of, part of what was so interesting about this story is Zhang Yin and Nine Dragons Paper bought mills in the United States, um, in Maine, where I live, and Wisconsin. And today they're, uh, they're processing so 1.1 million metric tons annually and employing over 1,100 people. So the value uh, that you seek is incredibly important and it guides your creation. And so that abundant perspective is essentially a new lens to look through. Um, these new perspectives have the opportunity to create radical transformation. We just looked at this one uh, instance, but to be clear, it is not just measuring impact and compliance. It's about redefining your possibilities and maximizing abundance. And the people who have looked at this, uh, there is a, have said there's approximately $12 trillion annually in market opportunities. 
in all sectors of the economy, from mobility to healthcare, uh, to energy efficiency, affordable housing, circular economy, manufacturing. Um, so there is a ton of opportunity waiting for nimble, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, to get in on it. So one of the things to think about is what are your boxes, right? And how could you think about them differently if you started looking at your business and asking new sets of questions? And wait, what could we be do doing to create no poverty or affordable clean energy or sustainable cities or gender equality? And so that's really the, the, the first start of the process is instead of looking at these as burdens, start looking at these as opportunities. Now, in terms of benchmarking best practices, um, you can think about your enterprise as being on a, a progression, right? A progression from um, sort of 0, 0.0 where you're a bad actor, and this would be a company that is maximizing profits at any cost, right? Only concerned with uh, what makes us the most profitable, regardless of whatever we have to slash or laws we have to break. Um, the 1.0 version of this is a law-abiding company. And you know the, the idea here uh, that you will pay the required taxes, but not a penny more. You know If it's legal, you'll do it. If it's not legal, you won't do it. Um, but that's sort of a 1.0 version. The 2.0 is you, you're a socially responsible company. And this is great because you're probably giving money to uh, local uh, nonprofits or you're volunteering, you're, um, you're showcasing volunteer efforts and things like that, but it's not really embedded in your strategy. So when times are tough, right, you can curtail those things easily. Uh, the strategic company, the 3.0 version, will really seek abundance to enhance competitiveness, but only when the dollars and cents make, make it work. And then finally, the, the most elevated company that would be a systemic company, and these are really the regenerative companies, the companies that seek to be a regenerative, a regenerative force for communities in the planet. Now, um, as you go through this, on this left side over here with the bad actors, you have a lot of risk and exposure, right? And a lot of danger from what may, may come. And then down on the other end here, you have a lot of opportunity and potential. And so let me give you a couple of companies. And these are large companies because I just wanted to use brands that I felt people were entirely familiar with. Um, you know, I could point to different companies here in Maine, small, medium-sized enterprises that are doing this as well. And I would say doing it better than some of the examples I'm going to use, but I wanted to make sure you knew the companies uh, so, uh, so that you would be familiar with them. So the, the example of a bad actor would be, you know, Volkswagen, right? So they had the emissions cheating scandal. There's been a tens of millions of vehicles recalled. They've uh, had to pay 30 plus billion dollars. Uh, several, several executives were imprisoned. Um, their stock price when the cheating scandal came out went down by 40%. Um, and so they're a really good example and they're trying to rehabilitate the reputation even to this day. Uh, a law abiding company would be Airbnb, right? They're, they're adhering to the local ordin ordinances, but there are massive impacts happening uh, outside of the company uh, that they're not necessarily addressing. Uh, Microsoft, who has uh, talked about offsetting all of their emissions from the moment they began, really is what I would say is a socially doing social responsibility, highlighting these efforts, but it it's not necessarily embedded in their strategy. And then you have Unilever, right, who touches billions of people worldwide every day. They've had a lot of movement going to zero waste, uh, reduce, reducing resource usage, et cetera. Um, and then um, just to juxtapose with Volkswagen, uh, you have Tesla, right? And Tesla um, really reinvented the electric car. Um, they are, are doing a number of different initiatives in the solar space as well. Um, and they've really embedded sustainability into the company. Um, and right now, if you look at Tesla, um, shockingly, they have a market capitalization of over a trillion dollars, right? They're worth as much as the next 10 largest automakers combined. But, um, but for, small and so for small and medium enterprises though, if you are moving up this chain and becoming strategic and systemic, 
there are a number of competitive advantages that you can get. So for your customers, uh, it's all about you know, creating fierce loyalty, uh, getting a second chance where literally people would leave you comments on your website saying things like, wow, you know, this experience wasn't what I expected, but I believe in what you're doing, so I'll be back. You get fierce brand advocates promoting you on social media. Uh, for employees, you become an employer of choice because people believe in your mission. They've also uh, looked at productivity and people work harder for a cause they believe in, which is not really a shock or it shouldn't be. Um, and also you create this culture of innovation because you are constantly trying to improve and drive things to the next level. On operations, you're reducing waste, finding new business models, restructuring your costs um, so you can be putting money where it counts. If you are raising money, you, know, you can find you can reduce your liabilities, increase your valuation because you have this added brand appeal and find capital that's patient. Uh, and maybe and be willing to support your growth because of the impact you're having. And on the marketing side, um, part of this is about discovering new experiences because you're doing your business in an entirely different way and building your brand and creating something that's tough to replicate. Now, so this is not to say that uh, sustainably focused companies don't fail. You still have all of the other um, market forces are, that are out there. But these are some real competitive advantages that any company would love to have. And so as you think about where you are, um, you know, about this abundance progression, where would you place yourself from a bad actor to uh, systemically abundant? And, and who would you seek to emulate? Now, I have looked at a bunch of different industries, everything from the auto industry, finance, food, uh, construction, insurance, and you can place companies on this uh, all throughout um, and almost every single industry from uh, retail to restaurants. And now, so we've looked at uh, changing your perspective around, we've sort of looked at this abundance progression uh, from 0, 0.0 to 4.0. So then the question becomes, you know, how do I, how do I do, how do I do this in my company? And how do I really have strategic innovation um, based on uh, building a more abundant world and fulfilling these UN SDGs? And so what we're going to look at is going back to this, the abundant perspective here, where you are combining people and the planet uh, to reduce your risk, cut costs, grow sales, find new markets. Um, and we're going to look at this lens across every aspect of your business and run every, every key element of your, every key component of your business through this filter to see how you're doing. And so this is what the abundance cycle looks like. And I know this is a lot to absorb uh, on, a, on a computer screen. Um, and so we're, I'm gonna step you through each component of it, but essentially it includes all of the activities of a business, your costs and your profits, as well as your uh, social activities and your environmental activities. You can see the abundance cycle here. It's a, a representing a circular economy and a circular business model. Um, all other models are oftentimes linear where you start with inputs and then you just have outputs and then they, the waste stream just miraculously goes away. Here you can see we've incorporated waste as unsold production. Um, and the key with this is you can start to see where your business is aligned and where your ideals and your goals line up with your strategy. Um, and you really want to be applying sustainability in the areas that are where you're competitively strongest. And so it's the most strategically relevant uh, because that's where you're having the most impact. So generally, we would start this process by just let's identify a sustainable development goal that you're really interested in as an organization. And we would pick that goal and use that as something to help us uh, you know, think about the area we wanna focus on. Then the first piece of this is really understanding the purpose of your uh, company and you know, why your enterprise exists. Um, this, in case you are wondering, this symbol here in the upper right just spells out logo. Um, 
And so you can put your logo on this, um, talk about why your enterprise exists, what is the problem you're seeking to solve. Uh, like if you've, if you've used the business model canvas, we want you to identify your customers and really why are customers using your product or service? What problem are you solving for them? You can have multiple customers, although I would say you probably don't want more than two, but for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm just gonna focus on only having one customer so it's easy to easier to follow. Um, in terms of your core activities, um, you know, all companies have these basic activities from inbound where you're gathering materials together uh, to operations where you are transforming those materials into a product or a service. You have your outbound distribution where you are uh, bringing this product out to customers. Um, marketing, we're all familiar with. Um, and then you have service after the sale. Uh, and this is about what kind of relationship are you building with your customers once they've, uh, once they've um, bought your product. And then you have unsold production. And you know, when you think of waste versus unsold production, you know, waste is something you get rid of. When you think of things that, if, that you're producing but not selling, uh, that's an, that may be an opportunity. And so what you can do is you can list out the key activities um, that you're doing in each one of these six core areas. And these are the activities that make a difference to your customer. Um, then you have this set of outer rings, these what are foundational activities. And the way these work is they happen all across the enterprise. And so you have, uh, for example, procurement or purchasing. And you have purchasing happening in inbound right here where you're buying goods in, and then in operations over here where those are being transformed into uh, something else and purchasing as well in outbound. Um, you have uh, different knowledge systems that you're creating. Um, and the knowledge systems are really these know-how procedures, et cetera. Um, you have the team development. So how are you recruiting people, hiring them, uh, training them? Um, you have finally the firm infrastructure. And that firm infrastructure is really uh, your legal form, management style, are you flat? Are you hierarchical? What is the structure uh, of, the, of the company? And again, these foundational activities happen all across the enterprises, and you can fill in the key activities in the segment where they apply the most. Then on the abundance cycle, you can list out your costs here as a percentage of sales uh, in the middle. And what this allows you to do is activity-based costing. So you can see what percentage of my costs are in inbound or operations or outbound, et cetera. Um, and then in the center here, you can list your profit or your loss as a percentage of sales. And in doing so, you can see how much are you making for each euro or pound that you sell. Um, and then finally, with lining up with your competitive advantage, um, you, you want to document down here, like how, and think about how does your enterprise really delight customers and surpass their expectations to create competitive advantage? Um, you can highlight the different segments of competitive advantage. And so here you have marketing and operations uh, that this company is using. And then um, there also may be some foundational activities here, such as your purchasing and marketing, or uh, how your knowledge systems and your team development over here in operations that are key um, uh, to your competitive advantage. And what, what you're really looking for here, and the reason we're spending the time on the business itself is we want to understand the strategy of the company. We want to understand how the costs line up so that we can make sure that our sustainability efforts are happening in the areas where they matter most. Because in this company where you have marketing uh, and operations as competitive advantage, if we're doing something over here in unsold production, that may be great, but that's probably not our biggest area for impact. And so you want to make sure that the sustainability efforts are in the areas that are core to your enterprise. So you're looking for inconsistencies, uh, internal alignment, 
And the areas of your competitive advantage are likely where you're spending the most money and having the greatest impact. So now that the business is laid out, uh, we can lay out our social initiatives uh, right here by the people. And you see there is space for that in all of the segments. We can also lay out here our environmental initiatives and see what is happening. And then a very common thing uh, for most companies is to think like, oh, wow, if I'm going, if I am, if I want to be sustainable, I need to reinvent the wheel. And something we actually did was went out and looked at what are small companies doing uh, and multinational corporations and developed a library of tactics that you can use and think about. And each one of these uh, is an opportunity to rethink your business and, and figure out what you're doing. So I'll highlight two of them here that we'll use for this company. One is radical resource productivity. The idea here is you are just simply doing more uh, with less resources. The other is uh, regenerative marketing. So what is your marketing? How are you spending your marketing dollars? And instead of spending them just to think about them as advertising, how can, can you spend those same dollars to be a regenerative force? Um, can you send them on, spend those on projects that actually improve uh, social or environmental performance? So if we go back to our abundance cycle, uh, you can apply those tactics here. And you can see here uh, on the social side for our marketing spend, we're using regenerative marketing. And uh, up here in operations, uh, we're using radical resource productivity to rethink our operations and, and really uh, take them to the next level and improve efficiency. So if you were, to, so if you were filling this out uh, digitally, which you could do, you, know, you would have something that looks roughly like this. If you were to go um, and download the abundance cycle, and this is one that was done in a program in Denmark, um, and this, these folks were looking at uh, using unused shipping containers as grow boxes for vegetables. And you can see here uh, their company purpose listed right here. You can see they've, they started with one tactic, which was waste is food. How do we take a waste product and use that as a resource? But they incorporated impact investing and micro enterprise. And you can see these three different sticky notes up here with their different uh, customer groups. So. Uh, the quick journey we've been on this morning was really, we started with changing perspective, moving from you know, scarcity, risk and compliance to opportunity and innovation, then into benchmarking best practices, and finally merging strategy and sustainability uh, with the abundance cycle. And each one of these creates an, a new opportunity to find innovative practices. Uh, if you'd like to check out the abundance cycle, there are uh, templates you can download, uh, or you can go to Miro. Um, and right here is the website in the Miroverse. There's a template for the abundance cycle. And you can see here, uh, over here, you have uh, uh, instructions, a, dem a demo abundance cycle, as well as all of the tactics defined. And here are multiple abundance cycles so you can iterate um, your journey. And so on Miro, you'll find this video, instructions and all of these pieces uh, that I talked about. So with that, uh, I guess I'll take a breath and turn it over to Q&A um, and thank you. Great, and, and thank you so much, Jay, for, um, for a real practical um, talk on, on how to really embed sustainability um, in organizations. And we'll be able to uh, send out the the, the web link here to, to, um, to these uh, and the different templates and that uh, to, to all those that have registered. Um, just before we kick into some of the Q&A from, um, from the audience, I was just wondering, um, like, do you have an example of a company that went through this process of the abundance cycle? And I'm sure we'll get into the more details of it in the masterclass for, for particular SMEs and, and coming from their own interests. But do you have an example, maybe, um, like I know you showed a, a picture there of an SME or business working on it, but yeah. maybe an example of how an organization kind of did change as a result of going through the process. Yeah, I mean, so we worked, you know, I've done this, I've done this program with, um, you know, for profit organizations, nonprofit and, and governmental, um, you know, when I think of, you know, there's one quick example off the top of my head is uh, this last fall, we were working with uh, 
a t-shirt manufacturer, um, you know, who is in mid coast Maine and who does screen printing and other pieces. And, um, and for them, they were really trying to figure out, um, you know, they, they started charting out what they were doing in the different area and it led to uh, different innovations around like uh, different suppliers, uh, locating different suppliers. Could they, instead of competing as a commodity product, were there ways that they could differentiate through the supply chain and become more of a premium producer and have, um, you know, and change their margin structure around. The other thing they were looking at was uh, inter-store shipping because they were, they were both a manufacturer and then they had four or five stores around the state. And so they were looking at new ways of shipping uh, to reduce packaging costs. Um, and so those were some of the innovations that came out of working with them uh, over a, a, a few week period. Great, thank you very much. And just in the Q&A, there's a question around, um, I suppose, like a lot of SMEs are dealing with COVID at the moment and trying to, I suppose, in a, perhaps maybe in a bit of survival mode. Um, like is now a good time to invest in looking at sustainability or do you need, I guess, resources um, in the background in order to engage in this? Yeah, so... I think there has been this mythology around sustainability that one, you, you always have to make the product more expensive and two, you need a ton of resources uh, to do this. And I don't think either of those are true. Um, I think the one thing, and I, and I imagine Ireland is, is similar to the US where the thing that's been most remarkable to me about COVID is I have seen so many businesses reinvent themselves and there are projects that they have undertaken, like I just think of like the restaurant industry or even grocery, where um, people have instituted online ordering, delivery, things that they would have said, oh my gosh, I never, I don't have time to do that. Uh, I can't change my business model. I have to have people coming in my shop. And then suddenly they converted to where it's all curbside pickup. Um, and so, yeah, I would say, you know, the time to do this is, is now. I would say the other the other piece with this is one of the nice things with the abundance cycle is you can chart out where you wanna be and then look at like, what are those first steps that we can take that are maybe not, you know, retrofitting the entire store or, um, you know, there may be some simple, simple things you can do like on the marketing side, like in COVID, could you have a regenerative marketing campaign that brings the community in and helps people find and build community as a result of your marketing efforts. Like that may be a really low hanging fruit. Or I know in the US we're, we're facing a lot of inflation. So now is the perfect time to look at like what's in your waste stream and how you could reduce, um, you know, some of those, reduce your waste, reduce tipping costs and actually um, save on money or reduce energy use, let's say, uh, and save on money. And I'd say the other thing with COVID right now is there's a lot of incentive programs and just coming off of COP, I know in Maine, at least, there's programs that will help pay for retrofits to businesses and doing other things to make your uh, enterprise more sustainable. So if you have those as well in Ireland, I would take advantage of those. So yeah, so, now yeah, so there is like creating efficiencies um, uh, uh, that you can, you know, reducing waste and then also, um, you know, um, exploiting opportunities. And then also there's funding mechanisms around this to help SMEs. Yes, absolutely. And I would also say building SMEs have a real advantage in the, in the building community aspect, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of them, the community is invested in them anyways. And so it's a way to further, I think, your presence and your sales in the community by steering marketing dollars towards supporting community organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's another question just as, um, in relation to if it's a service uh, company, so a service SME rather than having a particular product, um, you know, can you still, what would you focus on in the abundance cycle or, or how would you, because um, you talk about operations and things like that, so what, where would be the focus if it's a predominantly service company? Yeah, so every company will have different areas of competitive advantage and different areas of emphasis. And so, um, you know, so for if you're a manufacturer, like obviously maybe inbound and operations, if you're a service company, it could very well be inbound and, you know, training your people. It could be operations in terms of, not in terms of manufacturing so much, but in terms of 
uh, training people up, but I would say definitely around distribution and how are you getting things out there. Um, but you know, it would depend on the type of service you're offering. But for each company, you're going to have different areas uh, that'll be important. For some companies, it could just be a marketing, you know, organization or marketing and looking at service after the sale to build those communities. Um, so, so it would be different for every kind of uh, organization, which is one of the nice things about the model because. Every company does all of those things, but they all do them to different extents. Mm -hmm. And from your model, um, you know, it, you, you know, it, you talk really about, you know, embedding sustainability um, within the whole organization and, you know, perhaps moving up in terms of that ranking that you had as well in terms of the degree to which it's embedded in. Does it require like a sustainability manager or um in an organization or do you need those kind of do you need sustainability expertise i suppose in terms of people yeah on board it's, it's amazing to me like i've talked to companies that have billions in sales and they'll have one or two people working sustainability and i think what you really need is a place where people know they can go to have their ideas be heard mm -hmm. because ideally it doesn't reside within one office it's something that you want pushed out to all parts of the organization. So everyone is thinking about it. And so, you know, so you're getting ideas from your frontline people as well as from your managers. Um, and you'd be surprised at how much, when people know their ideas will be heard, how many ideas start to come forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the other thing for me that's really helpful with this is if you understand which areas are most strategically relevant and where you really have competitive advantage, that can help you prioritize like, oh, wow, this is a good long term project. This is a good short term thing that we can do. And, you know, you can pick out the different areas of emphasis and think about them, you know, that way. Does it require um, a again, in terms of embedding sustainability in the organization, does it require kind of an open innovation approach? Are you typically looking at creating new networks and what kind of networks would you would you engage in? Or Yeah, you know, it's fun for the most of this. SMEs I've worked with, the networks are, are pretty informal. Um, and so I think it, it's more about tapping into people's, I think about it as tapping into people's potential mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and bringing them in and letting them know. And, and for the small, medium enterprise, I mean, people are generally, are oftentimes engaged with, you know, the leadership. And so once the leadership is talking about this and demonstrating it and people see that it's important, then the ideas can start to, to bubble up. But I mean, I've been amazed that even in, you know, really large companies, um, you know, it might be someone, you know, who's managing the fleet of the, of, um, you know, of a company and says, like, hey, if we do this, this would save us X amount of money. And they were just looking for a person to help them get it approved. Mm -hmm. And I think the advantage for small and medium enterprises are you don't have so many layers, mm -hmm. right, to, to go through. So it's more flexible when you're yeah. Um, and just another question um, as well is from the audience. Do we need independent objective evidence to verify our credentials with respect to SDGs? So, so this is one I'm truly torn on. Like, yes, that would be fantastic. If you're gonna, if you're gonna make those claims, you need to have some sort of way of verifying that that information is true. I think one of the, the big issues within sustainability that has not served as well is people have focused so much on measurement that they've almost forgotten that they have to run an enterprise. And so for me, I take the approach of like, let's figure out what our strategy is. Let's figure out where we're competitively strongest and let's see where sustainability fits within what we're doing versus, you know, you, because you could spend all day trying to measure. Um, and, and so if you were have limited resources, I mean, my, I would always have a bias towards action. Uh, and the S, if you're looking for measurements, the SDGs actually do go into quite extensive um, measures and you can pick out ones that you, that you are looking for. But I would say move into action. And then as you get honed in and figure out where you're going, then I would get some measures in place. But I think in some ways, um, People get really bogged down in the measurement regimes that I've seen, and we and a lot of these issues are so soft it's hard to figure out a really good way to to get a measure on them. Right, and just before we wrap up to go into.
to our, our masterclass um, and, and indeed in the masterclass we'll delve more deeply into the abundance cycle and we'll look at particular SMEs who are joining us in that class. But what would be your key kind of takeaway message to, to SMEs generally for, um, from, the, from your talk? Yeah, I, I think that the advantage of the SME is that you can move quickly and you can get started and you can build the team of people who are going to be doing this. And this is a way, you know, we talked about COVID before. This is also what I, I see this as a way to get your uh, employees excited about doing stuff that they care about. Because in the end, at the end of the day, most people want to go to work and do something they feel really matters and makes a difference. And like something we used to talk about is like really being explicit, like, okay, you are doing this small task, but do you realize like the overall impact we're having here and here's where we're trying to go? And people get on board and they get really excited about that. And, and I think that is one of the things. So I think the time to do it is now, and it's a way to uh, rejuvenate uh, your business and, and move, keep things moving forward. Great, uh, thank you so much. So we're, we're going to have the masterclass starting at three o'clock for those who, of you who have signed up for the masterclass. And in that, we'll, as I said, we'll, we'll delve more deeply and, and, and look at individual businesses to see how you can apply this abundance cycle. So just to wrap up, um, on behalf of Intertrade Ireland um, and the All Island Innovation Programme, as well as the Whitaker Institute, um, I just want to thank you so much, um, Jay, for joining us live uh, this morning and this afternoon for us. Uh, and thank you for those wonderful insights that were a very practical way of um, looking at sustainability and embedding them in, um, in SMEs. So we'll break now for 10 minutes or so, and we'll start at three o'clock. There is, for the masterclass, there is a separate link for people to go into. Um, and that, uh, that was sent out to you by email, so you'll be able to access that link. So, um, and in that, we, we'll look more closely at, at the SMEs. But thank you so much again for the lecture. And um, thanks also, of course, to Intertrade Ireland, who are our, our supporters and our sponsors of these, these programs, um, are these events. And there are more events to come, of course. And uh, now that you have registered for this event and if you signed up to our, our list, you, you'll, you'll get more information about upcoming events through our list. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you at three o'clock in a separate link for the masterclass. Thanks, everybody. See you then. Thank you very much. <laughs>